So Hierakonpolis is uh, one of the most famous sites in ancient Egyptian history. It's, it became an incredibly important site, um, and it continued to be so well into the Greek occupation of Egypt. Um, in fact, the name itself is Greek. Hierakonpolis means city of the hawk. And of course, the hawk is associated with the Egyptian god Horus, um, whose religious uh, practitioners worshipped um, here at the site. So. During the Nakata II, we see the founding of a relatively large settlement surrounded by a series of smaller outlying villages. And so here you can kind of see this occupation here of the pre-dynastic town. And it's about a kilometer or so from the, the Nile itself um, at the time. So it's up off of the floodplain, um, away from the site, on the edge of this large wadi, um, a seasonal riverbed. And so our occupation here is represented in the Nakata II by a relatively large town. Uh, but it's continuously occupied into the Nakata III and into the early dynastic or the old kingdom um, period of Egypt. And it's an incredibly important site and the excavations have focused on the old kingdom occupation at Nakin here that have been some of the most important finds in all of Egyptian archaeology. Um, and we'll talk about one of those a little bit later. Um, so the site was originally visited by uh, Sir Flinders uh, Petrie, and we've already talked about him as being kind of one of the foundational figures of archaeology, um, and excavated after his visit beginning in the 1890s. Um, so we've had about 130 years now of continuous occupation um, at the site. Um, from the 1890s to the 1920s, our excavations focused here um, at Nakin. In the 60s and 70s, when archaeologists returned, um, they focused primarily on this Nakata II pre-dynastic town. And since the 1990s or so, archaeologists have been exploring the area on the other side of the wadi, in particular HK11, which you read about for today. And so here we can kind of see this associated settlement um, on the other side of the town. It's incredibly important for the social structure um, at the larger village uh, that we see up here. Now, during the 1970s, uh, archaeologists excavated a house at the site. And this is one of our best preserved uh, remains of the day-to-day -day lives of one of the inhabitants um, at Hierakonpolis. It's not a palace, but what it is is a workshop and a house for a potter that dates to around 3600 BCE, fairly early into the Nakata II phase. Um, and what we see here is that the individual living here was producing um, uh, lower class, lowest status vessels, not the highly fine polished stuff that we find um, in the royal tombs, but rather cooking vessels, um, and probably relatively large cooking vessels uh, based on the size of the kiln in relationship to the rest of the objects. So they're making cooking wares. Um, the house itself is relatively uh, unique at Hierakonpolis, and it's rectangular in plan. Um, it had a raised floor hearth. Um, you can kind of see that here, the circular hearth for cooking food inside of the household itself. Um, and we see a lot of daily day-to-day -day, day -day activities, suggesting that even though this individual was a potter, uh, they were still responsible for, uh, the household was still responsible for making most of its own food, um, producing things like its own clothing and things like that. Um, now we also see a series of post holes outside of the house that suggests they had a roofed pen enclosure uh, for animals, suggesting they also um, kept their own domesticated animals for consumption. And it contained a large walled courtyard um, that probably contained pasture space, uh, but also the area for the workshop. Uh, the large kiln itself suggests industrial scale production of cooking vessels and probably also beer production vessels um, at the site. Um, so you can kind of see this uh, be representing um, the daily lives of one of these inhabitants. But HK29 is important as well because this house is located right off of a large ceremonial platform. Um, this thing covers like 200 uh, square meters. Um, and when you start to look at the extensive courtyard floor um, surrounding a series of workshops and uh, encased um, it by a wooden palisade. Now if we kind of look at the photo here, you can see the remains of that palisade. There are a lot of little post holes and then these massive post holes here um, that are representative of uh, huge timbers that were used to construct this wall. And the thing to keep in mind is this is the Nile Delta or the Nile Va upper, Va not, 
upper Nile Valley and there's not a lot of trees. So these trees would have been brought in, either floated down the Nile from Central Africa, but one of the uh, key locations that we can see this lumber coming from is actually Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon were incredibly important um, for trade, both for Uruk Mesopotamia, um, but well into the biblical time period uh, for the production of uh, uh, large scale uh, structures. And so this may have been floated across the Mediterranean, up the Nile, um, and brought here and put into place um, within this. So we can kind of see this large ceremonial complex out here. Now the other thing that's really fascinating about this is um, we see the attached production facilities, including that uh, house, um, which you see up over here, producing pottery, but also uh, uh, craftspeople making polished stone figurines and beads and vessels all of which are showing up in the royal burials that we're going to talk about later at HK, uh, in HK6 at Hierakonpolis. Now, what makes this also really fascinating is that the site is surrounded by uh, numerous large refuse pits uh, that contain fauna remains. Uh, and these fauna remains are likely why were this potter was making a lot of large jars, because they were probably cooking food uh, for the consumption in large-scale feasts. Now the contents of the, the pits is also fascinating because about 15 to 20 percent um, of the fauna remains here are from wild taxa, that is wild species like hippopotamus and Nile crocodile and Nile perch. Um, whereas in the domestic structures we see maybe about 2 percent of wild taxa, meaning that only about 2 percent of the animals that they eat are coming from non-domestic uh, um, animals. And I think this is important when we start to think about the way the Pharaoh is presented in Old Kingdom Egypt. He is shown as being the person who has pacified nature. And so the fact that this individual here, um, whoever's in charge, is bringing people together in this large ceremonial enclosure um, and feeding them something like a hippopotamus is important. Because remember, the hippopotamus is the most dangerous animal in Africa. They're highly territorial. They weigh like uh, one and a half tons, and they can swim th uh, 35 mile an hour and run up to 30 mile an hour on the water. And so they're the most deadly creature in uh, Africa today. And so the fact that someone can serve hippopotamus at a feast like this is a big middle finger to nature. Right? So I think this is a, a pharaoh making a statement um, saying that the that they're this powerful, the leaders here, that they're, they're this powerful, they can control nature, and they can control it so much that they can feed it to the other participants. So we can think about this as a symbolic feast of control of nature associated with HK-29.